Hi, my name is Anna Gluckstein. I'm a teacher um, in Hackney and a uh, member of the SWP in Enfield and Haringey, and I'll be chairing the meeting today. Um, the way the meeting will work is the speakers will speak. Unfortunately, uh, Vladimir cannot come, and Thomas will explain why. Um, he's fine, but he's just unable to come online. Um, so Tomash will speak for about 25, 30 minutes, um, and then there'll be plenty of time if you want to speak. You just put your hand up, and the uh, team members will come round with a roaming mic um, and get your questions, contributions. You'll be kept to three minutes, um, and I'll be tapping, and at the end of three minutes, I'll ask you very politely to stop talking, um, and then there'll be time for um, Tomash to come back at the end. Um, so I'd just like to welcome Tomas Sengeli Evans. He's a member of the National Leadership of the Socialist Workers Party and he's responsible for our anti-war work and he'll be speaking on Ukraine torn apart by imperialism. Over to you, Tomas. Thank you all for, uh, thank you all for coming. Can you hear me with this microphone? Uh, no? No? no. <laughs> <laughs> Does that work? Yeah. Excellent. Well, first of all, I think for all of our sakes, I'm sorry that um, Vladimir can't be, uh, can't be here today. He said he's running a temperature of 38.5. Um, but he says, let's try and do it next time, or perhaps when they finally allow Ukrainians to enter Britain visa-free. This is the only country in the whole of Europe that requires visas from Ukrainians and pretends to be the biggest defender of Ukraine. Uh, with <laughs> which rather points to some of the uh, hypocrisies which I'm going to um, talk about. Um, I could do this meeting by talking for 10 minutes to what I plan to say and then talking for 10 minutes pretending to be uh, Vladimir, but I don't think that would really work. So I'm just going to um, go through some of, the, some of the main arguments which I think we, uh, which are important around imperialism and Ukraine. Um, the first thing I want to say is that I think the last year has brought home the horrors of imperialist war to many, uh, to, to many millions of people. Uh, tens of thousands of dead, hundreds of thousands turned into refugees or displaced, um, shelled out hospitals, bombed out apartment blocks. But as well as bringing home those horrors, I think it has vindicated those of us on the left who said, yes, Russian troops out, but we also need to say no to NATO escalation and NATO expansion, and that you cannot, cannot back either imperialist power as a solution to the horrors that, uh, that are taking place, and in fact that it is the competition between those two powers, between the West and Russia, which is driving uh, the conflict, uh, uh, conflict in Ukraine. And I think we have to see Ukraine as part of a much bigger shift that's taking place. Uh, the Russian invasion didn't just unleash, uh, unleash death and destruction onto Ukraine. It also marked a very dangerous turning point in world politics. Um, what do I mean by this? Um, if we think of the last 20, uh, 20 years or more, the situation that socialists and anti-war activists have faced is basically of the US hegemon uh, meeting out death and destruction onto weaker powers, not exclusively, but largely in the global south. Um, Somalia, Afghanistan, Iraq, and so on. And I think obviously that's an important part of what, what's, what's taking place today, but we are seeing the return of great power competition between the United States and Russia, but also the United States and China, a, a, a much greater fault line within, uh, within the world system. And of course, you don't have to um, take my word on any of these things. Um, NATO itself, before the Madrid summit last summer, said that we are faced with, quote, a world of competing great powers. Uh, the strategic concept at the Madrid summit says uh, we, are, we are moving towards a fundamental shift to our deterrence and defense, including, quote, more forward deployed combat formations, more high readiness forces, more pre-positioned equipment. Um, the official review group set up by the NATO uh, chief, Stoltenberg, reiterated the shift towards interstate rivalry in the wake of the Russian invasion as being the, the main dynamic uh, that's taking place. 
The main characteristic of the current security environment is the re-emergence of geopolitical competition. That is, the profusion and escalation of state-based rivalries and disputes over territory and resources. In the Euro-Atlantic area, in other words, the area dominated by US uh, imperialism, the most profound geopolitical challenge is posed by Russia. But it goes on to say, the growing power and assertiveness of China is the other major geopolitical development that is changing the strategic calculus of NATO. In other words, NATO itself says we have to understand what's taking place in Ukraine as part of a much greater clash of imperial powers, not just Russia, but also China. And part of the calculation of US imperialism say we want to bleed Russia dry. We want to keep this, uh, keep this going because that will also send a signal to China and in our growing imperialist rivalry in, uh, in, the, uh, in the Pacific. And I think that's an, that's, that, that understanding that context is crucial to understanding Ukraine, uh, the war in Ukraine. Because the dominant narrative about Ukraine is that this is a conflict uh, between democracy and authoritarianism. This is simply about uh, a stronger power, Russia, attacking a weaker, uh, a weaker state, Ukraine. Now, of course, that's an important element of it, and we are against the Russian invasion. Uh, it was an imperialist invasion, and we're for Russian troops uh, getting out in the SNVP. There's no you know, equivocation about that. But that's not the only dynamic that's going on, and as I'm going to develop uh, uh, in this meeting, it's not the dominant dynamic uh, that's taking place either. So if that's not, that's not it, uh, what is it? And I think for this we have to try and understand uh, two things. First of all, uh, what is imperialism, which I'm going to briefly um, uh, try and explain. And second of all, what was the strategy of US imperialism and of Russian imperialism leading up to uh, the Russian invasion? First of all, I think there are many dominant understandings of imperialism which say it is just about um, stronger states dominating weaker ones. Now, as I said, that's an important element of, uh, of what takes place. But fundamentally, a capitalist imperialism, understanding what's taking place today, you have to see imperialism as a global system, system, and this is important, of competing capitalist states, which is driven forward by, 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 the, uh, by the big capitalist states, the United States, uh, Germany, Russia, China, Britain, uh, and so on. And it's this, uh, it's understanding it as a system, as a totality, which is really important. Because I think there's, you know, there's other people on the left who um, don't agree with our sort of position on Ukraine, of Russian troops out, no to NATO, who say, yes, yes, of course there are different uh, imperialist powers. It's not just, uh, it's not just Russia, or it's not just the US, but really, you just have to look at who's the bad guy in this situation. And yes, we know NATO's done some bad stuff in Afghanistan and Iraq, but in Ukraine, Russia's the bad guy. Don't really worry about NATO. Um, you know, in Libya, uh, yes, NATO's done some bad stuff, but you know, Gaddafi was the bad guy. So therefore, don't worry about what NATO's doing. You know, people like um, uh, Shilba Achkar, really, what comes through is that he doesn't really conceive of imperialism as a system. And there's this interaction between different imperialist powers which drives it forward, and therefore you can't back either, um, either side. And I think that's, uh, so understanding it like that is, um, is important. And what you have with imperialism is a system where you see capital spilling across national borders, but growing interdependence between the state and capital, uh, where you know, corporations rely on states to put forward their interests and so on. <coughs> But just because you have a spilling of capital across national borders, it doesn't, and it, you know, interdependence between different economies, it doesn't need to less conflict, as some would say, that's because fundamentally capitalism is not a system of even development. And therefore, that uneven nature of capitalist development means that there's still, a, 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 the logic of competition drives forward, uh, drives forward the potential for uh, imperialist uh, wars. You know, there is interdependence between uh, the US and China. Does that mean there's no competition? No, 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 because of that unevenness. How does this apply to, um, the, to what's taking place within Ukraine? Well, first of all, I think we have to understand that Ukraine is at the center of a much greater fault line of inter-imperialist rivalries. 
Um, this fault line begins with the Baltic states in the north, cuts down through Ukraine to Moldova, through the Caucasus, an energy-rich region, crisscrossed by uh, various pipelines, and then into Central Asia in Kazakhstan. And the inter-imperialist tensions are rising right across, uh, right across this fault line. And actually, escalation uh, within the war could actually set off a much set of other conflicts, other frozen conflicts along this fault line. Quite a dangerous uh, situation. Now, why are those tensions rising? And again, I think we have to understand it as part of a broader, uh, as part of a, 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 a broader context. Firstly, uh, after the Cold War, uh, the United States emerges as the uh, as, as a preeminent military superpower. Um, you know, George uh, George Bush Senior, after the first after the first invasion of Iraq, says there will be a new world order, and what we say goes. Uh, this is this is the principle that will govern it. Now, that was true, but as a <clears throat> one of the, a, a war criminal who recently turned 100, Henry Kissinger said, the situation is actually much more complicated than that, and we are going to face economic competition on a scale that we have never seen uh, compared, to, uh, compared to previous times, particularly from China. So a big preoccupation of US imperialism after the 1990s, uh, after the end of the Cold War, is to say, how can we try and assert our hegemony uh, within the world? And that was, you saw in the 1990s, growing um, uh, American interventions, Somalia, Yugoslavia, and also the expansion of NATO. We need to send a signal that we're still uh, top dog in the world. The real chance, of course, comes with the war on terror. And this is what fundamentally the war on terror uh, uh, was about with the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq. And you know, people talk about uh, Iraq being a war for oil, and in one sense it was, but it's important not to be crude about it. Um, uh, because, because the United States didn't need the oil itself as a sort of a resource grab, but it wanted to control these vast de de deposits of oil in a strategic part of the world, particularly because then it could say to China, your growth will be dependent on our goodwill. The problem for the United States was uh, Iraq turns out to be a major geopolitical defeat for the United States, and instead of sending the signal that it's possible uh, that uh, America is still top dog, it sends the signal that uh, it's possible to challenge uh, U.S. interests, perhaps not on a global scale, but on a regional, uh, 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 at least on a regional basis, by other uh, uh, by other imperial powers. Uh, one such state is Russia, and I think this is where we have to understand. What the, what the strategy of Russian imperialism was. So after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, something in the SWP we celebrated, um, the Russian state is severely weakened. Uh, the sort of free market shock therapy reaches deep into the military industrial complex. Uh, it causes a social crisis, and you have serious uh, you know, fissures, uh, uh, fissures within the state. Uh, nonetheless, uh, Russia is still determined to, uh, to assert its interests in what it calls its near abroad, uh, the sort of republics that used to be part of the Soviet, uh, of the Soviet Union. Uh, because it's in a much weakened state, it relies on fermenting ethnic conflicts, civil wars and so on, uh, Georgia, Abkhazia, Ingushnetia, uh, Moldova, and so on. And the basic idea is, if our neighbors have frozen conflicts, if they're weakened and divided, they'll be easier to dominate. And that's, what, that's our strategy. Um, one sticking point is Chechnya, uh, which declares independence in 91. And Russia initially isn't able to overwhelm the Chechen resistance. It's only been after 99, where P Putin, uh, Putin rises to power, promising to kind of centralize the state with the backing of the oligarchs so that the state is better able to assert its interests uh, and the interests of the, of the Russian capitalist class and is able to overwhelm the Chechen resistance and this coincides with a spike in the oil prices and through that sort of combination of both quelling the Chechen resistance which the West by the way was very, was very much for uh, at that time 
um, Blair flew to, to, to Russia to congratulate um, uh, Putin on this, but it's through this process of, of that and the spike in the oil prices that Russia becomes much more able to, to, um, to assert its interests in, um, uh, in its near abroad. Um, now, of course, his, here it interacts with the other, other, uh, other imperialism in the United States, which had broken its promise to the last leader of, the, of, of Stalinist Russia, Mikhail Gorbachev, and so they said, we will not expand NATO eastwards, but NATO had continued to expand. And the clash comes at the 2008 with the Bucharest summit of NATO. Um, and Bush, uh, the Bush administration is very keen on expanding NATO further and opening membership, the possibility of membership to Georgia and to Ukraine. And there, you know, there's some people within the administration who say, look, you know, this is actually a bad idea. We're, we're fighting this bloody disastrous war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, do we really want to open another front? And the Bush administration, Bush and Cheney, make very clear, yes, we do, because in the face of all of these challenges, we need to say, we need to send a signal that we can assert our hegemony, and we also need to say to our European allies, France and Germany, who didn't really support us over... Uh, over Iraq to say we're top dog and we're expanding NATO and you've got to get behind this project. Um, what happens with Russia? Russia invades two separatist regions in Georgia because you're not allowed to be a member of NATO if you have an internal territorial dispute uh, unless you're the Turkish state. But that's another story and I don't have time to go into that. Um, uh, and, and Georgia, in many ways, is a dry run for what happens in 2014 in Ukraine. Uh, now, how, how long have I got? You have got 12 minutes. 15, Great. No, 15 minutes. Oh, terrific. Um, <laughs> uh, what happens in 2014 in Ukraine? And I think there's many different interpretations on the left uh, uh, about this. Um, that either this is a glorious sort of uprising for um, democracy, or it's a sort of fascist coup, and neither of those analyses uh, are true when it comes to 2014 in Ukraine. Uh, the fundamental point is, this is, not a crime, this is not about Ukrainian democracy and independence, this is a crisis about which imperialist camp Ukraine will be part of. That, that's what the crisis is, and you have to understand it as part of that context. Um, the Ukrainian state uh, is facing a severe financial crisis by 2000, uh, by 2014. It was hammered by free market shock therapy uh, in, in the 1990s, all the asset stripping and so on, and then by the financial crisis, the global financial crisis in 2008. And at the uh, Ukrainian politics is dominated by a series of oligarchs, sort of powerful, powerful, you know, uh, business people, powerful sort of political interests, if you like, right? These big, big, big capitalist interests. And the oligarchs sort of balance between the West and Russia. One group looks more towards Russian markets, another looks more towards integration with the West, but they nonetheless balance. The president at the time, um, uh, Yanukovych, is more kind of from the pro-Russian faction, um, but nonetheless was, was also balancing. Faced with this financial crisis, what happens? Russia says, um, look, we'll bail you out, but you've got to be part of our camp, and you've got to be part of the Eurasian Customs Union, and you can't be part of their camp. You can't look, you, you can't look towards them anymore. The European Union, which is a sort of wannabe imperial bloc, <laughs> imperial bloc in alliance with NATO and the US, um, part of that political system, says, oh, we'll give you money as well, but you've got to be part of our club and you can't be part of their club. And essentially, you know, Yanukovych um, hesitates for a time, but then ends up saying, look, we're going to sign the association agreement with the, with the European Union, and with EU membership, of course, you know, closer ties to NATO, uh, 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 and so on. Uh, in response to this, there are protests that take place, uh, initially quite small when it's just about the question of, either of the EU association agreement, but then in response to police brutality, particularly the, the section of the riot police, um, those protests grow uh, uh, to, become, uh, to, to, become very, to, to become very big. And the, the reasons that people are on the streets vary from, you know, it's not just about you know, the EU association agreement, it's about police brutality, elite level corruption, and so on. Nonetheless, the product of that revolt, which you know, forces out the, the Yanukovych, is 
a government that's pro-Western. You know, there's no strong enough left force able to put forward an independent position or, to, or for the working class to, uh, to put forward uh, working class demands in the way that we would have you know, liked. And the product of that of 2014 is a government which is pro-Western and also where nationalist forces increase in weight within civil society and the Ukrainian uh, uh, and the Ukrainian state. And therefore, what's Russia's response to that? Where it seems like Ukraine will pivot just towards the West, it annexes Crimea and sponsors the um, separatist insurgencies in the Donbass, the, the so-called People's Republics of Donetsk and Luhansk. You know, these aren't People's Republics. These are, you know, uh, run by right-wing, far-right gangsters. Okay, uh, Igor Birkin, for instance, is one of the defense ministers. Uh, of one of the republics, you know, it was part of the ethnic cleansing in, in, in Yugoslavia. You know, these, these are not progressive people, just some people on the left hear the word people's republic and they think, ah, oh, praise. But, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's bollocks. Um, so they sponsor these insurgencies. Um, fast forward, 2015, you see the Minsk uh, process, a sort of series of, um, of um, uh, sort of, a, a, you know, trying uh, peace treaties and so on, which basically frees the conflict um, that takes place. Nonetheless, just because you have a frozen conflict doesn't mean the competition between uh, the West and Russia stops. And in fact, you know, from 2015, uh, the US is pouring in more arms. It wants to bring in the Ukrainian armed forces to have interoperability with NATO. In other words, to be part of that, uh, part of that, um, uh, part of that alliance, part of that system. And really what takes place is a growing, uh, growing rivalry despite the Minsk process, despite the sort of a frozen conflict that takes place. And then by 2021, what becomes very apparent is that, um, that Russia is not able to compete with the superior economic weight of the, uh, of the United States and of the European Union. And it's very clear that you know, you, they are going to pull Ukraine in this tug of war uh, taking place towards the uh, towards the Western orbit. Um, Russia, you know, has energy resources, it has oil and gas, and so on. But its economy uh, and its economic base is actually is actually quite weak. It can't compete with that, and therefore, you know, the Russian invasion isn't some sort of wild move by a sort of you know. Putin, who's a psychopath or something, in the way that you know you see in the mainstream press, it's a in terms of imperialism, it's a, the Russian state thinking, well, we can't compete economically in, in this tug of war, and therefore a full frontal invasion is the way to stop uh, Ukraine going off into the Western camp, and that's what fundamentally drives it. So one is they're losing this economic tug of war, and secondly, in that near abroad area, the sort of republics that used to be part of the Soviet Union, you did see revolts take place in recent years, since, since 2014. Um, Belarus, for instance, which are genuine revolts. Again, there's very mixed politics between liberalism and so on. And the West hopes to benefit from them, from the fall of uh, Moscow-aligned you know, strongmen like uh, Lukashenko. And you know, from the point of view of the Russian state and Putin, this is very worrying. And they think by invading Ukraine and scoring a victory, they will send a signal to all those other states, you know, don't try and go out of our orbit. We're still, uh, we're still in charge. Uh, we're still in charge here. And that's fundamentally, I think, what then, what drives that invasion. So you can't understand the Russian invasion as just sort of, you know, this is the start of the war. There's actually, it's a longer process of inter-imperialist rivalry, and the war is the latest phase, uh, phase within that. So it's, it, it's not just about Russia versus, uh, versus Ukraine in the way it's presented, democracy versus uh, dictatorship and so on. It's about two rival imperialisms fighting over, uh, fighting over Ukraine. And you don't have to, again, you don't have to take my word for that when it comes to, uh, when it comes to it. Um, Colonel Alexander Vindman, for instance, was um, part of the US National Security Council. In, in November two, uh, 2021, uh, he was at an event um, in London and he praises uh, US leaders for, quote, some recognition of Ukrainian strategic value to NATO, end quote. However, he complains that this is, quote, well short of where we should be weighing Ukraine in terms of regional and geopolitical standing, end quote. This weight, says Vindman, could, quote, enable US and Euro-Atlantic aspirations for competition with Ru Russia and competition with China. So there you go, straight from, you know, five minutes, okay, that's...
Uh, but straight from what you know, the US is saying, Ukraine is of strategic importance to us uh, because of we want to assert our imperial interests. And what you have right now is a very high stakes situation where the war hasn't gone the way Russia wanted. You know, it doesn't st its standing hasn't increased in the near abroad. It's actually humiliated in the eyes of in the eyes of many of its um, neighbours. Uh, think about you know France was mediating between Armenia and Azerbaijan of Nagorno-Karabakh uh, uh, earlier this year. Normally that would be Russia's role. You know, a, it, you can see how things haven't gone to plan here. But that doesn't mean that you know Russia's just going to you know put up its hands and go fine. We're, we're weakened. A key part of military doctrine in Russia is, well, look, we, can't, we are weaker than the West, and therefore, when push comes to shove, we may have to use tactical nuclear weapons. Um, so that's a very dangerous situation. Uh, and the more NATO and the West pour in arms for their own strategic, for their own strategic ends, the more, the, 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 the more that becomes a possibility. So this is a dangerous situation. And what fundamentally the US wants to do is to use Ukraine to overcome its defeats and weaknesses in Afghanistan and Iraq and so on, and to reassert its hegemony in the world, in particular in this growing conflict with China. Um, so I think, you know, Ukraine torn apart by imperialism, I think is the title of the meeting. Well, that's how it's been torn apart by imperialism and how imperialism is continuing to do that. Um, okay, what do we do about it in the remaining three minutes I have? Uh, I have left. I think the dominant argument that, you, uh, that you, you face, certainly in Britain, is, well, look, whatever you think of NATO, you have to support NATO pouring in arms to Ukraine because this is fundamentally a question of national self-determination. And I want to uh, address how we can uh, address how, uh, this argument. Now, of course, there is an element of a war of national defense on the part of Ukraine against Russia. Um, We've always acknowledged that. And then there's the inter-imperialist rivalry, the inter-imperialist war. And what you have to ask is, which of those factors is dominant in Ukraine? And I think it's the inter-imperialism which, uh, which is dominant uh, uh, within this conflict. Now, on national self-determination, we come from a tradition where, uh, you know, Lenin argues that socialists should support national self the right to national self-determination, first of all, because it helped to break working class people in imperialist countries from kind of nationalist ideas, which bind them to their ruling class. So, you know, in Russia, support it, you know, saying we support, you know, we are against the invasion, helps to counteract kind of greater Russian chauvinism and so on, right? I don't want to. There are other situations then, Lenin says, that you don't just support the right to national self-determination, you would actually actively fight for that because it can be a blow to imperialism, a country breaking away, a national liberation movement winning. But you always have to understand national, uh, questions of national self-determination in relation to imperialism. And uh, this is a question that confronted socialists at the beginning of the First World War. Um, the First World War begins when Austria-Hungary invade Serbia, okay? Now, one position of socialists could be to say in this situation, well, look, Serbia, weaker power, invaded by Austria-Hungary, we just have to support the Serbians against, uh, against uh, uh, Austria-Hungary. Um, and that, 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 so many people did, uh, did say that. But then another position to say, well, yes, that's part of it, but it's part of a much wider clash that's taking place. And I just want to, I'm probably going to go a minute over, but sorry. Um, part of a much uh, wider clash that's taking place. And this is the position that um, was taken by leading people within the Serbian Social Democratic Party. Now, remember, Serbia is invaded here, right? but nonetheless, the Serbian Social Democrats uh, didn't vote for war credits. German Social Democrats did, all the other major Socialist Social Democratic parties collapsed. The Serbians, who had invaded, took a principled, uh, took a principled position on this. One moment. And uh, this is Dusan Popovic, who was um, in correspondence with Leon Trotsky, and he, he writes, for us it was clear that as far as the conflict between Serbia and Austria-Hungary was concerned, our country was obviously in a defensive position. Austria had been carrying a policy of conquest against Serbia long before the latter had become an independent state. Basically, Serbia is defending its life and its independence. 
which Austria was constantly threatening even before the Sarajevo, Sarajevo assassination. If social democracy had a legitimate right to vote for war anywhere, then certainly that was the case in Serbia above all. But then Dusan Popovic goes on. Yet, however, for us the decisive fact was that the war between Serbia and Austria was only a small part of the totality, merely the prologue to the universal European war, and the latter, we are profoundly convinced, could not fail to have a clearly pronounced inter-imperialist character. And I think that's the situation. Therefore, they didn't support the war credits. And that's what we're facing today. The dominant character is this general inter-imperialist clash that's taking place. And, you know, it's not the situation in Ukraine isn't exactly like the First World War and so on. There's no blueprints. But that method of analysis of saying, well, what is the dominant characteristic of this war? And that's inter-imperialism, not national self-determination. The cause of national self-determination has been subordinated to the inter-imperialist uh, rivalry in Ukraine. And that's something that Zelensky, too, is clear, you know, he, he's decided that the future of the Ukrainian state and the particular national project he has come to represent lies with becoming an outpost of US imperialism. When he says, I want Ukraine to become a big Israel. Well, what is Israel? It is an armed, illiberal outpost of US empire. And that's what Ukraine will become if it's part of the, the Western camp and, uh, and NATO. And then when it comes to the question of arms, we have to, uh, we have to understand it in this context. I will sum up now. Uh, to understand it like this. Look, we want Russian troops to leave, yes? And we've, but the question is, how, do they, how are they forced out, okay? And one option is that they're forced out by US and NATO arms. That will not lead to an end to war. What that will lead to is a strengthened US imperialism, which will say we have overcome the, uh, the, what's happened in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we will be in a stronger position to take on China in this much wider clash. That is what the outcome will be. Therefore, we have to look to another force. That, 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 that to the end of war. And I think there's three important elements here. First of all, in a nutshell, we have to look to revolts in the imperialist countries against war. I'm not saying that's an easy thing to argue for, but it is the only anti-war and anti-imperialist position and solution to the crisis here. One, an anti-war movement in Russia, which can seek to take on uh, Putin and where working class anger at the regime could fuse with anger over the war. And just to say, it's not automatic that, that would, even we're discontent about the war would go towards the left. And I think you saw that with the, with the march on Moscow and the coup by Prigozhin and so on, and the dangers of that. But nonetheless, there is precedent for that to happen. In the West, it has to be an anti-war movement and a left which stands in solidarity with people in Ukraine, stands in solidarity with the anti-war movement in Russia, but nonetheless refuses to capitulate to the smears, to the lies, to the bullying, to say, you can't oppose NATO anymore, and you have to oppose NATO. And that's also vitally important for people in Russia, because when the regime says, if you're against the invasion, you're a stooge of NATO, and they're able to say, no, there are people in the West who are against the Russian invasion, but they're also against NATO, that's vitally important for activists on the ground there as well. And in Ukraine, it has to be a vision of a country that is free from both imperial camps. And that doesn't easily come about but we have to put forward that sort of principled uh, anti-war position. Uh, you know, more than 107 years ago, the Kienthal Conference took place. Uh, there were fewer people at that conference, um, which sought to bring together the anti-war left in Europe during the time of the First World War. There were fewer people in the room than there were in this room right now. Less than 18 months later, revolutions had ended the war. Now, I'm not promising you that in 18 months, revolutions <laughs> will end the war, but it was vitally important for Lenin, the Bolsheviks, the Serbian Social Democrats, and others to take those principal positions, rather than adapting and falling behind rival imperialist powers, which is what the majority of the left in the West and Eastern Europe has done to adapt their politics and to basically take a pro-NATO position. And that way lies you give up your political independence of the working class and you tie yourself to your own ruling class and you put the whole uh, project of a socialist transformation of society and internationalism uh, down the drain. And therefore, it's difficult, but that principal position has to be made now in order so we can, so we can fight for that much bigger transformation too. Thank you.
I'll just tell you. Uh, well, uh, thank you all for the uh, discussion. I'll try and come back on the, po uh, on the questions in, in um, two broad points. Um, the first thing to say is that in the Socialist Workers' Party, we have never looked towards um, other imperial powers as being our friends in some way in opposing US imperialism. We supported the breakup of the Soviet Union. We characterized the Soviet Union as a state capitalist country from 1928 to 1991 and supported workers' struggles in Eastern Europe and in the Soviet Union against uh, the communist parties and those regimes. Um, however, saying that isn't, cannot be an excuse for dropping opposition to, one own, uh, to, to one's own imperial power. Um, it's very easy to impose imperialism if you're uh, many miles away. It's much harder to impose your own imperialist power because the pressure on socialists in every country is to say, you must line up behind your own government, you must line up behind national unity and so on. So, you know, in Britain, it's easy to say we're against Russian imperialism. It's absolutely crucial. The hard thing to do is to say, no, we're not going to support our own government. And the key test of anti-imperialism is, do you oppose your own imperialist power if you live within one? And if you fail to do that, you're not taking a principled anti-imperialist position. It's lip service. And therefore, we, you know, our position is shaped by where we are. So yes, we are talking a lot about opposition to NATO. If I was in Russia, I would be aiming my fire as a socialist. I would be aiming my fire against the Russian invasion. I'd talk about the inter-imperialist rivalries, but I'd, talk, I'd say that's the key task. Because I'm in a NATO country, I can't bring down the Russian government. The Russian, only the Russian working class could potentially bring it down. But in, I'm in a NATO country, and therefore I can build opposition to what my government is doing, and, 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 and we are in a, in a NATO one. This flows from a way of opposing war, which was developed by revolutionary socialists in the run up to the First World War. Now, in 1914, the majority of the Second International, the Socialist Parties, the SPD and so on, collapsed into supporting their own uh, imperialist powers in Germany, uh, and, uh, being the most sort of notable example. What were the parties that refused to line up behind their own imperialist powers? It was the Serbian Social Democrats, a faction of the Bulgarian Socialist Party, and the Bolsheviks in Russia. They were in a minority position. But what was the argument that was advanced by people like uh, Karl Liebknecht and Lenin? And it was, that, it was that you had to turn the imperialist war, the bosses' war, into a war against the bosses' system. And therefore, the job of socialists in every country was to be for the defeat of their own ruling class. And you know, people said, you know, come on, Lenin, uh, what are you talking about? How can everyone lose? And he says, look, the point is that their class can lose and our class can win. And that's how we have to reframe our understanding of this. It's not, we support different states. We support, uh, have to have a class position, which is very against all those ruling classes. But the way you can take on that system is by opposing your own ruling class. It has to start with opposing uh, your ruling class at home. And that's not about making excuses for other states. It's about understanding where we, where we have potential influence. Um, and I think that's... Uh, uh, so, so I think that's, that, that's the kind of approach that shapes what we're, um, uh, what, we're trying to build, uh, what we're trying to build here. Now the second thing is, I'm not saying that this is going to happen. However, what's the alternative? That we give up our, the, an, an internationalist politics and end up supporting uh, other powers. Uh, and once you do that, as I think the, the, the comrades from Poland said, once you give up, give up and say, we back our government over the question of war, well, once you back national unity, the logic is to drop class opposition to that government and to actually uh, and to drop those things in the name of the war effort and so on. And that's a that's a very dangerous, uh, dangerous set of uh, a very dangerous set of uh, politics, I think. The other thing then is I'll, I'll stop in a minute. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to have I'm going to go over a bit. Sorry. Um, the the last thing is I think a lot of a lot of the discussions are seeped in a certain kind of moralism. And I think we have to um, understand where that comes from, uh, because what's going on in Ukraine uh, is horrific. However, we also have to say, well, look, we do have to have a political analysis of what's taking place. And inter-imperialism is an important uh, way of understanding that. And it's a totality. You have to see this as part of a system 
of competing capitalist powers which are driving those horrors. And therefore you can't say, in this situation I'll oppose that imperialist power, but in this situation I'll oppose another imperialist power, you, you, because you know, they're the bad guy in that one and they're the bad guy in that one. You have to see it as part of that system. Now, when it comes to, um, I'm, I'm finishing, when it comes to the question of national self-determination, look, there are many national liberation movements which have taken arms from other, from other imperial powers. In 1916 in Ireland, the Kaiser, the German Kaiser, wanted to give arms to the um, Republican rebellion. But the Republicans in Ireland were not fighting to become an outpost of German imperialism. Zelensky is fighting to become an outpost of US imperialism. And that's the difference. We have given up an independent politics of national liberation and tied himself to the West in a way that uh, you know, the Republicans in Ireland had in the way that the Vietnamese or the Algerian movements had whilst taking arms from different powers. And that's the crucial difference. What's the driving force? Is it an independent national liberation movement that retains its own political goals or has it become a proxy? Yes, with its own interests and so on, but is it subordinated to that imperialist power? And I'm sorry to say that's what has happened. It's a tragedy that that's happened. That wasn't inevitable when Ukraine gained independence with support right across East and West for independence in Ukraine. But it's what happened because of those imperialist rivalries which have created the horrors and the tragedies there. And therefore, we have to oppose both of them. And we have to oppose that system. And we can't pick and choose. And it's the, the imperialist war and the question of the uh, war of national defense, quite rightly, are not mutually exclusive. They're part of a totality and the dominant factor based on what's taking place is that the inter-imperialism one is the dominant one. And therefore, we, in the NATO countries, we have to build opposition to NATO whilst opposing the Russian invasion. In Russia, as difficult as it is, we have to try and show solidarity with the anti-war activists and hope that those a kind of struggles can link with anger at what the regime is doing. And that's not a, that there are no shortcuts, unfortunately. There were no shortcuts in 1914, and it might be a very long process, but if we are serious about being internationalists, that's the sort of position we have to hold in.